So today we're starting a new series on kings, not the book of kings, but uh, a story on, on kings. And uh, if, you, if you're a, a reader of the Bible, and we, we all should be as a community of God's people, uh, in a, on a mission to become more like Christ, doing this together as a family, as you spend time in the Bible, there are certain words that kind of pop out sometimes. And when there is a word that appears in every single page, or every single book, I should say, of the Bible, when there is a, 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 a word that appears in the beginning, and appears in the end, and is sown throughout, chances are that that is an important word. Uh, and so, uh, as a result of some meditation uh, on, on this word, kings, I came up with this teaching series, and I've been looking forward to teaching this for a very long time. And it, uh, be, it was the kind of thing where all of a sudden, you know, kings here, kings there, kings there, I just couldn't help seeing uh, this theme on, on kings. The word itself appears 2,500 times um, in the Bible. And so, what, what, it, what it is, is uh, it's a theme study that we're going to do on kings. We're going to talk about kings. And uh, we're going to kind of study this thing out. So I hope you get into this. Uh, there are very few topics in the Bible that you find as a foundational story. The story of kings is in the beginning, and it's foundational. It's part of the foundational story, the gospel, really. And then it's sown throughout all of the Old Testament, appearing in over 2,500 verses in the Old Testament alone. It's part of the story. It's like you can't pull kings out. You can't tell the story without talking about kings. And then the story uh, finds itself uh, in fulfillment in Jesus. And you, you can't pull ki uh, the word kings or king out of the story of the gospel, out of Jesus. And finally, at the very end of the book, we find that the, this king word, this king imagery, this king theme and subject finds its fulfillment in the very last pages of the books of the Bible. So we're going to be talking about kings. And um, I have four goals for this series. And number one is that, that we would tell a good, enjoyable story. Um, I, I, man, I want you to love reading this book. I want you to enjoy reading this book. I want you to, to, to feed on this book, like Psalm chapter 1 uh, talks about that, uh, that blessed is the man who delights in the word, who delights in the law, meditating on it day and night, and that man will be like a tree planted by rivers of living water. And as a community of Christ followers, it's uh, important for us to, to delight in the book, to like, look at it as a delight. Like, it's not an obligation. It's, uh, it's paradise. Um, I look at my Bible differently than I did when I first became a Christian. I look at it now like, uh, like I need it. Like, I, I feed on it. Like, life gets me down, but this book pumps me up. Uh, l life can, can mess you up and, and uh, give you difficulties and, and tough times, but spending time with Jesus and seeing him come alive in the pages of this word, it keeps me centered. And so I really hope to tell a, a good story because as I began to study this thing out on kings, I saw the, the, the theme of kings, the subject of kings early in Genesis, and, a, and this beautiful story began to emerge in my, that my eyes were so open to it. I like it, finding its fulfillment in the one who is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So uh, everyone loves a good story, and I think that we should be able to enjoy and might I even dare say be entertained even. And be you know, a good story grabs a hold of you. And, uh, and the best stories, man, they settle down deep into your heart. I like to think of it this, this way, that I really enjoy reading the Bible, but I like it more when the Bible reads me. Like, I like to read it, but it's not just about me consuming the content, though that is what it's, it, partially what it's about, but when the Bible, when I see my life through its lens, when uh, the words go into my heart and I, I can look at my life and compare it to what the Bible is talking about and I can see how that, that verse applies to me or that scripture applies to me or that story applies to me. So I wanted to tell a good story and I want to learn lessons as we talk about kings, as we start this series. Uh, like There's so many lessons uh, in this theme study on kings. So let's let the story speak to us. That's the second goal. The third goal is to shine a light on the greatest king, uh, the king of kings and lord of lords. That is... Uh, above all, probably the central uh, point of this message series is to show how when the Bible talks about kings and it shows us what human kings are like and it illustrates for us what kings become from the beginning as we walk our way through the story of the Bible, which is truly the story of history, we can see how, what kings have become and how kings of this earth compare to the one great and true king. And so there's this beautiful contrast that we see as we talk about kings. So that's the third goal, is to shine a light on King Jesus. 
the king of kings, the king of nations, the king of all the earth. And, and you know, when you see Jesus, man, you can't help but be compelled, be moved, and fall in love with the person of Jesus. And last but not least, examine our life in the light of his story. So without further ado, let's begin the story of kings. And uh, let me ask you a question. Where do you find the first mention of kings in the Bible? If you had to guess, where would you think it would be, appear? In Genesis, right? So we're going to look at Genesis chapter uh, 2, and, and I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. You know, I think if you've been a Christian for a long time, there's a danger in sometimes opening up your Bible and reading a familiar story and coming at it with this thought, like, I know what it's going to say, or I've read this story before. I can predict where it's going. But I think what we should do is what David did in Psalm 119. When we read the Bible, pray, Father, open up my eyes that I might behold wondrous things out of your word. Like there are wondrous things to behold in this word. And even though this passage of scripture might seem familiar, and it's, I know I talk about this, this passage a, a lot, let's look at it with fresh eyes and a fresh approach and see if we can't see something new, something awesome, something relevant, and something for us today, okay? Okay, so we're seeing with fresh eyes, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. This is the first appearance. This is the first time the Bible talks in any way, shape, or form about a king, all right? And it doesn't specifically say king, but the language the Bible uses is king language. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now, when I was thinking about and dwelling about this verse and about God saying these words as they're coming out of the mouth of the Most High God as, he's, as an act of creation on the sixth day. He's making this pinnacle of his creation. He's making mankind. I, I, I just began to picture it as like a symphony or an orchestra. Like God is saying something incredible. And it's like the angels are on edge. What is God going to say? Because with every, God, every word of God, it's a creative force. And so I can picture like the hosts of heaven hanging around, waiting on God, waiting for him to say and waiting for him to say something what is God going to do and he does something unexpected because don't forget they're angels right the angels are also called Elohim they're they're God spiritual beings they're like geo, small g gods they're you know the sons of Elohim is what angels are often called sons of God they're they're spiritual beings like God is a spiritual being and they're waiting what is he going to say what and he says let us and it's like this just huge orchestra that erupts and bursts and praises. He says these words, let us make man in our image. In other words, it wasn't just a, a conversation between God and it, it was, but I believe the, other, the angels were paying attention during this act of creation. And when, when he said these words, and when mankind came forth, and when man did this incredible thing, I think there was an eruption of praise. Like this, what you did, God, was we, ne we didn't expect it. We didn't see this coming, and you just blew our mind. He said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion, king language, have dominion over the fish of the sea. He's already created those. Over the birds of the air, he's already created those. And over the cattle, he's already created those. Over all this earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, he's already created all those other things. And then on the sixth day, he makes animals and then he makes man and he says, he, this, this man, this creature, this being, let this creature and let this being have dominion over it all. Let, let man be the king that rules underneath my kingship. Let man be the one who represents me on this earth. Let man be the one who is king of this land. Let man be the, the one who rules and has dominion over the land. Then verse 8, 28, then God blessed them and God said, be fruitful, be fruitful and, and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Like, like, Adam, you tend to this garden, you be fruitful, you make it grow, you tend to the garden, Adam, and I'll tend to you. I'll take care of you, so be fruitful. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. More, more king language. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. So in the garden... Man has been given this responsibility and, and, and dominion. The first kings that were mentioned in the Bible were Adam and Eve. King Adam and Queen Eve. Authority was given to mankind in the garden with the express purpose of making the earth a place of paradise. In other words, the work, the, the work wasn't finished. God made the earth, and it was without form and void before he spoke on it. He started the work, but he wanted man to continue this project and to bring paradise over all the earth. Have you ever had somebody 
that was supposed to represent you do something that didn't represent you well? Have you ever had somebody that's supposed to represent who you are, maybe your character, or you send an ambassador, you send a representative to do something, and, and they just didn't represent you? It's embarrassing, isn't it? When you have somebody that's supposed to represent you well, mankind is supposed to represent God well. And it happened to God. And as we follow the storyline of kings, and we talk about kings in the Bible, the picture that we're supposed to, to see is, first of all, that God created humanity to be kings. Like, he created you and me and you and I. Our, our, our royal purpose, and that's the, the title of today's message, our royal purpose is that we would be like kings that reign under the authority of the one true king. That's our purpose. Like, we reign underneath the authority of the one true king. But as it happened, and you follow the storyline, it's hijacked, right? That man listens to the deceiver, and they give away their authority. God, the great artist, gave the earth as a canvas for man to paint the picture of order and beauty. God said, man, you rule, you reign, you're king of this. This is your responsibility, this is your place, this is the royal design, this is your intention, this is who you are, this is what you are supposed to be. And you know, I love the way God rules, this is the way God does things. He gives purpose, and he gives vision, but he doesn't do it with control. In other words, he doesn't tell man, you shall do this exactly this way, you shall do this exactly this way, you shall do this exactly this way. He says, use your creativity to take the vision that I placed in your heart and to move this thing forward. He doesn't stand over his shoulder and correct him and say, you didn't do that right. You know, he lets man use his creative ability to accomplish the vision that God put in his heart. You know, God basically said, Adam, you know, Go into the world and multiply, subdue it. Phil, you've seen how I do things, Adam. Now do that. You've seen, Adam, you have seen how I bring light out of darkness. Now go and do that. Adam, you've seen how I brought order out of chaos. Adam, go and do that. Adam, you've seen how I brought life to a lifeless planet. Now, Adam, go and do that. He just gives him this vision, but he doesn't say, this is exactly how you're supposed to do it. You know? He gives him creativity. That's just a good leadership, a good way of being a, a leader, is to give people the freedom. If you think about it, I like to think of it this way, that each and every single one of us was created in the image of an infinitesimally creative, all-powerful God. You were created, I was created in the image of a God who is limitless in his creativity. What he does, what he makes, what he forms is limitless in his creativity. And you're made in that image. You're made in the image of a, of a creator who's so uh, wise and so so incredibly smart, you know? And, um, you know, some humans don't know that they're made in the image of God. Like, this is the truth. This is, this is who we are. This royal design, is, it should be center of who we are. That's why Jesus came. He came to restore human beings into this place. It's like we talked about at the end of a, uh, the study on, on Ephesians, how Paul said, you have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Like when Jesus rose and he ascended into heaven and a human being now sits at the right hand of God, Paul basically says, and when that human being Jesus rose, and when that human being ascended after 40 days, and when that human being sat down at the right hand of God, it was as if God was restoring man to his original purpose. And now you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the beautiful story of the gospel. That's the beautiful story. Amen. You can give the Lord a hand. Amen. So that's our purpose, and that's our, that, is the, that is the essence of, who, uh, of, of all of our purpose, the royal design behind the human race. And you know, if you get that like, settled down and deep, deep into your heart, that like, who you are and what God, Jesus says about you, what, what your purpose is, you don't really have to try to impress others. You don't really have to seek validation from another human being. If this is what God has said about you, if this is God's royal design for who you are, is to rule as a king underneath his, uh, his authority and to rule underneath his, uh, his responsibility and under, under his kingdom, you know, you're already a king. You actually, you're already royalty. You don't have to try to impress somebody else to get them to like you, to get them to be impressed with you. You don't have to do it, you know, because God already says you're made in his image. You know, and the enemy, I find, he, he treats people, he, he treats people like slaves when they're actually created in the image of a great king. He speaks, you know, even in the temptation with Eve, he spoke to her from down below, questioning, making her call into question who she really was, right? He even did it to Jesus, if you are the son of God. Jesus was already the son of God. He was already up here, you know? And so he's below, the enemy is below, and so as he speaks, 
you know, he tries to call into question the things that we are so that we will sink down, think less of ourselves and go down to his level because he's down here, right? He's defeated. He's, he's below us. He's, uh, that's why he's a serpent and the part of the curse was that he would crawl on his belly. He would be, he would be made low, right? So he tries to pull you down low by making you question who you are. And who you are is you are created in the image of a creator with infinite creativity and an infinitely brilliant mind. You're created in that image. And even though we lost it in the garden, and even though, you know, when, when Adam and Eve fell, they went from glory to shame, right? They went from this glorious beauty. We're going to look at Psalm 8 in one second. It, they went from glorious beauty to shame. And Jesus on the cross, he, the Bible says he bore our shame. Like he became the son of God, the, the king of majesty, came down to this earth to become a human being, and he became shamed. Like the, the creation is shaming its creator at the cross. The, the creation is pointing to him and mocking him and laughing him. Jesus was, this, was the object of scorn and ridicule, the Bible says. He, he bore our scorn. He bore our pain. Why? So that he could also at the same time through resurrection and ascension restore us to a place of dignity and honor. So our poverty could become royalty once again through Jesus Christ. That's the beautiful story of the gospel. And that's what we're talking about in the book, of, or as we talk about kings in the Bible. So let's look at uh, Psalm uh, chapter 8. Uh, Psalm chapter 8. And you know, whenever we use something for a purpose other than that for which it was designed, it's frustrating to the user. Anytime we use something for a purpose other than that for which it was designed, it's frustrating uh, for the user. And I'm just going to use a little demonstration. Guys on the camera, I don't think I warned you, but I'm just going to step back just a little bit and grab uh, out of a grab bag full of tricks. In my little grab bag full of tricks, you guys know I like to do blacksmithing and bladesmithing. And I remember when I first started doing this, this, um, this particular discipline that I went to a blacksmith shop and... Uh, and, and took a lesson, you know? And in his, next to his anvil, he had this rack. And in this rack, he had probably a hundred different kinds of tongs. Like a hundred different kinds of tongs. And I'm like, man, what, what in the world do you need 100 different kinds of tongs? And then as I began to get into blacksmithing and bladesmithing, I realized that you need tongs for, to hold each and every different kind of shape of tool that you are making, that you are creating, that you are forming. And this one right here is actually a set of knife tongs. I've got a fake knife. It's not a real one. I can't... And you're not allowed to bring knives to church. Just ask our security guy, Kurt. Right, Kurt? So this is a fake. It's not a, it's not a sharp knife. So this particular tongue holds this r knife really well. I mean, you can yank on it. You're not going to pull it. But if I use a different set of tongs that aren't designed for this purpose, it can be very frustrating, right? And so when you're blacksmithing, you're pulling stuff out of a, of, of a furnace. And the furnace is like 2,000, 2,300 degrees or whatever. And so as soon as you pull it out into the atmosphere, you're fighting against... Uh, the atmosphere because it's cooling down immediately. And in order for this thing to bend under the hammer, it has to stay hot. So you want to be able to go quickly from furnace, from forge to anvil really quickly. And you want to be able to also be able to hold this so that you can hit this with a hammer hard so the thing at um, you know, almost 2,000 degrees doesn't go flipping and hit you or touch you or burn you or land. You want to have a firm grasp. And so each, each tongue is, is specifically designed to hold a material that is being worked on. If I asked you to, I could probably hold this with one hand, and I don't think there's a person in this room that could pull this out of, out of the hand with this tongue, would be able to pull this out of the, uh, the tongue. So anyways, the point being that it is very frustrating if I were to use a different set of tongs to hold that and just have that piece falling all over. In the same way for human beings who are designed in the image of God with a royal purpose and a royal design, which is to reign underneath in submission to the King of kings and Lord of lords. If that's not what your life is about, there will be moments of great, great frustration. Whenever you use something for a purpose other than that for which it was designed, you will become frustrated. And we were designed to live this way. God gives us purpose. God gives us meaning. God gives our life importance and significance. Not that every day is a bed of roses. Certainly that is not true. But he gives meaning even in the tough times. Even in the difficult times, he gives purpose and meaning. That's, that's the royal design behind your creation. Why did God make you? It answers the question once and for all. Why am I here? There you go. For a royal purpose, for a royal design, 
to, to live a life underneath the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ and to, and to live like a king. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to learn what it means in Jesus' eyes, how he rules and how he reigns and what a good king looks like, what a, a righteous and holy and just king. And that's our, that's our image, right? We reflect his image. And then there's kings of the earth. We're called to live like King Jesus. And we're going to study some things today about how the Bible talks about how he reigns and what he looks like. But look at Psalm chapter 8. It says, when I consider your heavens... Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, Father, when I look at what you've made, the vastness of this universe, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained and put in place and have moved and they function exactly like you created them every single day, just consistency, faithfulness. When I think about it, what is, what is man that you are mindful of him? I mean, the, the size of human beings and the vastness of the universe is so small. And insignificant when you think about it in, in terms of size, right? In terms of immensity, the universe is an enormously big place. And, it, we, and the more we study it, the more we send uh, uh, telescopes out beyond our atmosphere to look farther into the universe than we have, we've ever looked at before, we realize there's more, even more out there than we thought. Because in every little black spot of space, there's more universes and more galaxies and more bodies and more things that are, that are filling the skies that we just can't see, but they're out there just so darn far away. And so David looks up at the heavens to, to, at what he sees and says, man, what is man that you are so mindful of him? Verse 5, he says, this, this whole psalm is like a, his reflection on the creation story, and it's a psalm of praise that erupts from his heart as he's meditating on the creation story. And in verse 5, he says, you have made him, mankind, a little lower than the angels. That's the word Elohim. You've made him a little lower than the, than the spiritual beings and the, the gods, it's the word gods, then you've made man just a little lower than that. And you have crowned him. That's king language, right? King language. God created us and he crowned mankind with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, that pass through the pass of the sea. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm 8 is a, is a reinforcement of man's purpose and the royal design. We have been crowned with glory and honor. Did you ever think about when the scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? You know, the definition of sin, the biblical definition of sin, there's several, you know, and, but when we think of sin, I think and we immediately go to evil acts and evil deeds, and certainly that is what sin, that's part of what sin is. But another thing that is part of what sin is, is when something falls short of for what its original intention and original purpose was. When, you know, all have sinned and fallen short from, of the glory of God. In other words, to sin is also to fall short of the, the glorious creation and purpose for which we were created, right? And so sin is that. Sin is mankind not living up to the image of kingship that he was created to be. Sin is also mankind not submitting to the king of kings and, and not walking in such a way that, hey, I'm gonna, I rule in my little portion of the world that I have authority over, but I do it as I reflect him, right? Sinning is also not doing it the way he does it. So God never gives up on this plan, though we've given God millions of reasons to give up. He just keeps coming back, and he keeps coming back, and he keeps coming back so that we'll, can, we'll reflect his image. He never gives up on the human race. And what I'd like to do is um, take a look at the, the Hebrew word for king uh, because it's a beautiful illustration of how God sees righteous kings reigning. There's a beautiful story here. So we're going to put uh, the word for king up on the screen right here, and it's the word malak, and it's a beautiful illustration of what it means in God's eyes to rule well and to rule as part of the royal design. Malak, that is the Hebrew word for king. You'll notice there's only three letters there. There's, those are all consonants, and in the Middle Ages, you might see this word with like dots nearby. The dots were added later so that we would know how to pronounce like the vowel sounds in between, but it's pronounced malak. Want to say it with me? Malak. All right, ready? One more time on the count of three. One, two, three. Malach. Very good. You're learning, you're learning Hebrew today. So this is what it looks like um, in Hebrew, the word king. Now, the, I like to think of the scriptures as containing a script. There's a story that unfolds. Even in the letters, even in the words, even in the scriptures itself, there's a story that the Bible wants to tell. There's a story. And uh, so one thing about Hebrew letters that is different than 
uh, English letters. Number one, like in English, letters in Hebrew, they reflect a sound, right? That's what letters do. They reflect a sound. Number one, they do that. Number two, they're a picture. In Hebrew, every letter is actually a picture, not in English. Like, we don't look at a, the letter B and go, hey, that's a house, but they do in, in Hebrew, right? Um, so Hebrew letters are, are, are represent sounds. They represent a picture. And then thirdly, they represent a number. In other words, they don't have one, one through ten. They have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And A, B, C, D, E, F, G are also one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, ten. Okay, so it's a sound, it's a picture, and all letters. They're sounds, they're pictures, and they are numbers. And there's a story. So this is the word malek. This is the, uh, the word king in Hebrew. Uh, an easy way to read. And so it's the letters M, L, and K, and they read from right to left. Uh, in Hebrew, the one on the letter on the right is the letter Mem, which correlates to our letter M. The letter in the middle is the letter Lamed, which is the, corresponds to our letter L. The last letter on the far left is the letter Kaf or K. So if you want to do a little easy way to remember Malek, just think of Martin Luther King, M-L-K, okay? Malek, Malek. So this is the, this is the word. We're going to look at it, and it tells a story. Okay, so in Hebrew, they read right to left. So starting at the far right letter, that's the letter Mem, which corresponds to our letter M. It's a picture you can almost see at the top. It's a picture of a wave. So the letter M is a symbol for a wave or water and, and also people or nations. It's like a, a vast expanse of humanity, the sea of humanity, as it were. It uh, represents waves, but it also represents people like a vast expanse of, like all of humanity, you could say. It represents water, and it represents waves, but the sea of humanity. So on the far right, we've got that picture in the letter Mem. Then we have the letter Lamed in the middle. The interesting thing about that letter is you'll notice it's taller than the rest. It's the tallest letter in the Hebrew language. It's the letter Lamed. And what it's supposed to be is a picture of a leader, or specifically a shepherd's staff. Okay? And it kind of looks like a shepherd's staff. It's supposed to be a, a, a shepherd's staff. So it means to teach, but it means to teach in the same way that a shepherd uses his staff to teach, which is often to incite or to goad or to push in the right direction. You know, Sometimes you have to be taught, and sometimes you have to be pushed as you're being taught. But the idea here is also it's the tallest letter, so it represents like leadership, it's, it's the, uh, the tallest letter, and what, the, uh, what I've heard many people say who are Hebrew scholars is that it's, like, it's in the middle of the alphabet, so it's like a king who is actually higher and who from up here on high is looking out over the expanse of his kingdom. So Lamed represents a lot of things, but mostly it's a, it's a staff, so it means to teach. It represents learning. It represents wisdom. It represents a teacher who moves you to action. It's not just knowledge. It's like heart stuff. It's like a teacher who teaches really well that inspires you in your heart and incites you to good works, okay? And it's also considered the tallest letter. It is the tallest letter because uh, Hebrew people in general place a really high value on learning, on, on, on growing, on becoming more, you know, you know, for us believers, we become more like Jesus. So Lamed also represents movement upwards, you know, we're moving in, his, in the direction of the great king. We're learning. He's teaching us. He's, he's moving on our hearts. He's inciting us to action. And as we do that, what's happening? It's an upward, you know, back to kingship, back to royalty, right? That's what Lamed represents. So Mem on the right, Lamed in the middle, and the last letter is Kaf. It it's, uh, represents the letter, uh, the, our letter K. Now, what does kaf represent? Now, it's specifically a palm, but it's a cupped. It's supposed to be a, like a cupped palm. And so it represents a container, like almost like a, you can, it's also synonymous with like the word spoon, because you can like contain stuff. So what does the king hold in his hand? He holds power, okay? So it represents power, it represents a cupped, uh, like you know, a hand that's kind of closed almost, or closing in strength. So it's like a, a cupped palm. But because it's bent, it's also bent in the shape of a crown, so like if you invert it, so it's also, it's like a rulership or, or power or responsibility or authority. It's shaped like a crown, it represents power. But it also, because it's a palm that is bent, it also represents humility. It means to, to bow down. It means to make yourself lower. So if you put all the pictures together, 
You have the first letter, which is nations. You have the middle letter, which is the, the king, the leader, the teacher. And then you have the last letter, who rules in power, but he does so, he wears a crown of humility. So he's the king of the nations. In this, you know, so we wouldn't, you know, we see the letter, we see the word king, and we don't see any kind of picture whatsoever. But to the Hebrew mind, you look at this, and you see this story. You see a story of what, what, how God sees a good king, how, do, how God sees good leadership, how God sees good rulership. And that is a king. He sees the, the king who is in the middle, who, who looks over his kingdom, who is the king of all nations. He's the king of all nations. He's the king of all peoples. And this king wears a crown because not only is he on high, but he, he comes down low. He stoops down low. He's the great king. He's the, that's the way God sees kingship. That's the way God sees leadership. If you're a leader today, you're a manager, uh, you have people underneath you, rule this way. You're up here. You see things that maybe others don't see. Don't be haughty. Don't think like that makes you better than anybody else. The, the picture we have of Jesus is that though he is so on high, yet he humbled himself and became a human being to identify he, he, to, with us down here. He, he made himself low. And because Jesus made himself low, God lifted him up on high to the highest place. So if you're a leader today, lead like Jesus. This is what God sees when he sees kingship. This is what God sees. This is how leadership is supposed to take place. It's supposed to be hum, a heart of humility. And it's supposed to be the heart of, of, of bringing, the heart of a leader ought to be, I'm bringing you up here. And I'm not, I'm not intimidated when somebody down there comes up here. That's what the heart of a king is. The king is up here, and he's trying to bend low to bring people up high, just like Jesus did on the cross, removing our shame and bringing us back to a place of royalty. Amen? Amen. So he's the king. I'm going to show you a picture of, um, if we could put the alphabet up, uh, if we could put that picture up. This is the Hebrew alphabet, and uh, those are all 22 letters, and you'll notice that Mem Lamed Kef, the word king, is in the very middle of the alphabet. The king is in the midst of the alphabet. This, this stands out to Hebrew people. This stands out to Hebrew uh, people who study it. The king is in the middle, and you'll find Jesus. He's always in the middle. And he's like, he looks out over his kingdom. If we could look up the, the last, um, the last tesade, tesade. Okay, so I told you before that all um, Hebrew letters are also numbers. So mem is the number 40. Lamed, if we could put up uh, Tzadeh, that would be awesome. This, this, that's another letter. Okay, so the, the word Malek, the word king, three letters. Uh, the first one is Mem, it's, it's uh, the number, also the number 40. Add these up for me, if you will. For, okay, so Mem is 40, middle is Lamed, Lamed is 30, okay, and Kof, the last one, Kauf, Kuf, sometimes pronounced, is 20. What does that add up to? 90. Okay, so 90 is the number of the king. So 90 is the number, when you look at the number, if you were Hebrew, you'd look at it, you'd automatically go 90. you just see the letters, you go 40, 30, 20, 90. It would be like, like that. We don't think that way because our letters don't mean numbers, but their letters mean numbers. So they would see the number, they would see 90. You see 90, so you see 40, 30, 20, 90. So this letter is the, letter, is the number 90. It's the letter Tzadeh, okay? So Tzadeh is like the 20th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it's the number 90, okay? So the number for kings, the total number for kings is 90. And so what sade is, is sade is, is used in words like righteousness, like if you know the Hebrew word for righteousness, is tzedek. It starts with this letter, tzade. It's kind of like a T-S sound put together, tzade. So this is uh, the number 90. Tzade is the, the letter or the number 90. And you can look at it as a picture. What it looks like and what it is a symbol of is it's a, it's a person. And I think this one is, very, is easier to see than some of the other ones. It's like a person on their knees with their hands lifted up. Okay, so it's a, it's a person who is op op oppressed. It's a person, it represents a person who's poor. It's, it represents a person who's under difficulty. It represents a person uh, who's also humble. It's the posture which you should have to receive from the king. Because the great king, the great Malek, he is the great king because he responds to Tzadah. He, he responds to people who assume this posture. A, it's a posture of humility. Oftentimes we feel like this in life. You know, it's, it's a person who is on their knees, but their hands are lifted up. 
Like, think of a poor person when you, you drive by someone who's a beggar. They're, 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 they're bowed down, going through a tough time, and their hands are outstretched. They're like, they're, they're asking for something. Like, the story in the, in the gate, beautiful. You know, the beggar was asking Peter and, Peter and James, what do, you, do you have anything? Silver and gold have I none, but that which I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, right? So that was like a beautiful picture of tsasade, of what it means to, what this, what this letter illustrates. And so the great king, Jesus, is the great king because he bows down low and he responds to people who are, who are either because of humility, because they realize their place, because they realize his greatness and that they're not, and they're kings, but they rule underneath submission to the great king, and they assume a posture of humility and they kneel with their hands raised up, There's humility, but Jesus also responds to people who are under it, man. Jesus is near the brokenhearted. Jesus, where's the great king right now? Find someone who is hurting, and that's where he is, or at least he wants to be there through you, right? That's the the number 90 is what the whole, why, why is he a king? What does the king do? What direction does he move? What motivates him? Number 90, people who are bowed down, people who are struggling, people who are hurting. That's the essence of kingship. As we move through this series, keep that in mind, what a king is, how Jesus is this beautiful king who lowers himself to those who's, who are on their knees, who are oppressed, but whose hands are stretched out to him. That's our, that ought to be our posture, always. That ought to be our posture. And as we work through kings, we see kings showing up in chapter 1 of Genesis. That's Adam and Eve. As we move our way through kings, we find at the seventh generation of Adam, a man whose name is Lamech. L-A-M-E-C-H, or L-A-M-E-K. And what Lamech is, is he's the letter of the words king, but twisted, okay? So even though it doesn't call him a king, in Hebrew, if, like, if I put up the letters G-N-I-K on, this, on the screen, and I say, what is that? You would say, well, that's king, but it's backwards. You would recognize it immediately. You would say, that's the word king, but it's backwards. That's what you're supposed to see when you see Lamech. He's got the same letters, of his as the word king. His name, uh, it has no meaning, incidentally. There's no ma- name meaning. He's like a guy whose life was meaningless, but he rules himself. He is a, he's a picture of the first king after the fall who rules in such a way that he's like a selfish king sitting on a selfish throne, doing things his own way, ruling in his own way, not like, we're, not like the royal design. We rule as kings under submission of the great king, but he's outside of that, and he's ruling him. He's made himself king. He's exalted himself as king. That's Lamech. And it's a twisted version of kingship. It's twisted. You're you're supposed to look at Lamech and go, I see king, but I see a twisted man. I see a messed up guy. So let's read about the seventh from Adam. Seventh, we know, right? Bible scholars, we should, or maybe you haven't been around the Bible too long, but if you haven't, the number seven represents completion or perfection, right? So here we are, the seventh from Adam, the seventh generation from Adam. And is it perfect? Is it complete? Is it mature? Well, we're on Cain's side, we're going to see no. This is Lamech. This is the story of Lamech in uh, Genesis chapter 4. And verse 19, the twisted king. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, which means beautiful or pleasant. And the name of the second was Zilla, like Godzilla. <laughs> Her name means shade or shadow or to, to cover in darkness. So notice what Lamech does as he takes for himself. That word took is the exact same word that the Bible uses to describe what Eve did in the Garden of Eden when she took from the fruit of the tree, right? And the, the Bible says that Eve saw that, she was, that the fruit was Ada, pleasant. So the word Ada and the word took are here and they're also at the fall of man. Okay, so what we're supposed to see is a twisted king falling just like Eve fell and and going away from the royal design, becoming a king, a twisted king who rules. And what does he do? He takes, he takes how many wives? Two wives. What was the royal design? Adam and Eve. Like these guys are made in the image of God. What does Lamech do? He takes. And the Bible says, how did Adam come to be in covenant with his Ezer, his helper, his, the one who rescues you when nobody else can. That's what Ezer means. That's what the woman's design was. God brought Ezer, Ezer to Adam, right? As Adam's doing the things of God, submitting himself to God, you know, naming the animals, doing what he saw God do, and bringing order and life and light, he's doing that, and then God brings him a covenant partner. Contrast that with Lamech, who takes to women. And according to Hebrew tradition, Adam was beautiful. So he paraded around for others to see. 
You know, she was like all dolled up, you know. And then Zilla was, he, he used her for his own pleasure. He just took advantage of her. She was just there for him to use and abuse. He used and abused both of them. So the picture we're supposed to see is that this twisted king has this view of, of, of women and humanity in general where it's, they're his to dominate. They're not partners in, the, in, in ruling on the earth and expanding the Garden of Eden. He takes them, right? It goes on in verse 20, talks about his family, Adel, Baal, Jubal. Verse 21, his brother's name was Jubal. He who was the father of all who played the flute. Uh, Zilla bore him Tubal, Cain, craftsman in bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal, Cain, was Nema. Okay, so it goes through very quickly the line of uh, Lamech. It talks about his kids and, and, his, and the children that he bore. And then it says in verse 23, it says, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. So what is he saying? He said, there was a young man who hurt me, there was a young man who wounded me, so I killed him. I, I went out and I killed him because he, he hurt me. I just, in other words, Lamech is the kind of person who will get anybody who stands in his way Anybody who, you know, keeps him from doing what he wants to do, how does he deal with someone who stands in his way with, with nothing but violence? There's no appreciation for, for humanity. It's like, you were stood in my way, and as a twisted king, I use violence to get what I want. And then he says these words, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech shall be avenged seventy-sevenfold. What does that mean? He's looking back at, his, uh, at, at Cain, who was the second from Adam. He, Lamech is the seventh from Adam. So many generations ago, he's reflecting on the story of his great-great-great-grandfather, Cain, who killed his brother Abel. And if you remember the story, God showed mercy to Cain because God said after he killed Abel, he said, Cain, you're, you're not allowed here anymore. And he pushed him out into a place called Wandering and Nod. He pushed him out. And Cain was like, I can't live in this this way, God. I can't live alone in seclusion. And human beings aren't made that way. And you've pushed me into a place of wandering. And and anybody who sees me is going to kill me. And God says, I'll put a mark on you, Cain. I'll actually protect you. God showed mercy to Cain, right? God showed mercy to Cain. And so what Lamech is saying is, I'm 70 times worse than that. And he's looking at the mercy that was shown Cain. And he's saying, he's, he's like considering it nothing, He's saying, I don't even care about the way God showed mercy to Cain. If God's going to be merciful to me, he's going to have to do it 70 times 7, 490 times. I'm going to, I'm going to just use people. I'm going to abuse people. I'm going to step on people to get where I want. I'm going to crush people underneath my feet. Anybody who just wounds me, hurts me, insults me, I lash out with extreme flashes of violence. Cain was avenged sevenfold because God had said, anybody who hurts Cain, I'll make sure I'll pay him back sevenfold. And Lamech says, I want to be aven- I'm going to need to be avenged 70 times sevenfold because I'm just that violent of a person. He represents a twisted king. He represents an evil person. He represents what it means to not follow the royal design of ruling underneath God's rulership, but ruling where I am king. I am the king of this. And as we close, I just want to remind you of one thing. Do the, do the numbers 70 times 7 sound familiar at all? Yes. And, and remember when Peter, now reflect, you know, when, when things like this are there in the Bible, they're not there in Acts, and they should jump out at us. So we have this image of Lamech, this king, who is a twisted king, rules, and he's, he's his own king, hurts people just to get what he wants. And then we have this Jesus using 70 times 7 in a completely different way, where Lamech uses it to abuse the grace of God and abuse the kindness of God and, and think of the mercy of God as nothing. Jesus, in talking to Peter, when Peter says, how often should I forgive my brother who sins against me seven times a day? Man, I'm doing great. And Jesus, reflecting on the story of Lamech, I'm sure of it, I'm I'm sure of it. Pastor Dave and I were talking about this before. Jesus had to go back in his mind to Genesis chapter 4, the story of Lamech, and say, no, Peter, you're not a king like that. Seventy times seven in a day. In other words, at the core of who you are is you are a king made in the image of the king. And how does the king live? And how does the king rule? He rules by stooping low. He rules by humbling himself. He wears the crown because he's willing to go down to low, low to those who are hurting. Unlike Lamech, who, who hurts people. Peter, no. No. That's not how this king rules. That's not how King Jesus rules. How does King Jesus rule? 
His hand is outstretched to those who are, who are low. His hand is outstretched in mercy. His hand is outstretched in kindness. He is so powerful. He is so powerful. At any moment, he could wipe out the earth, but he's a God of mercy and grace and kindness whose heart is moved to those who are beneath him so that he can bring them up. Amen? Amen. So as we close today as the part one of the story of kings, and um, let's, be, let's be kings who do not rule like Lamech. Let's be kings who reflect the image of the one that we are made in the image of, we're made in the image of the great king. And the royal design for your life, the royal design for my life, is that we would rule underneath his rulership. Through Jesus, who made himself of no reputation, and the cross became a servant to restore us to position of relationship with God. Let's not be a Lamech. Let's be a Malek, a king. Remember the image of what, that, what the Hebrew shows us, that a person of mercy and kindness and grace. Amen? Let's be real Malex, not Lamex. Amen. If you would just bow your head and close your eyes as we close today's service. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name, and I thank you for this great group of people that are here, those watching. Father, I ask that you would um, open up our eyes to see that there is actually a Lamech that lives inside of all of us. There's a, there is an animal, there is a, the flesh, there is, a, there is a carnal tendency that is alive called the sin nature that is alive on the inside of us. And Father, we need the great king to come into our hearts, to come into our lives and to tame that part of our nature that tends to rear its ugly head when we don't get what we want, that tends to rear its ugly head when, we, when someone stands in our way, that tends to rear its ugly head when we act and behave in selfish ways. We all can be a Lamech. And we all need King Jesus. So, Father, I pray if there's anybody in this room who's never asked Jesus to be Lord of their lives, that even today you would make them know that their need is great. All of us, our needs are great. We need you, Jesus. You're the only king that could defeat death. You're the only king that could do what you did. We need a power outside of ourselves. We are not strong enough to restore ourselves. You are the king that came down to grab a hold of us and to bring us back up to a position of life and relationship with you. And if you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be king of your life, I'm just going to ask you to pray this simple prayer. And I'm going to ask the saints to repeat it with me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I come to you in Jesus' name. Jesus, name. Jesus I believe Jesus. you are the great king. There is no king higher than you, Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord of all the earth and the king of glory. And you stoop down a you came to this earth and we treated you shamefully and you died a death on the cross paying for the punishment we deserved so that we could be restored to relationship with you Jesus I believe that you died that you rose again that you're alive forevermore and that you are seated at the right hand of your father be seated on the throne of my heart today Jesus' name. Jesus name. Amen.